travel with C-SPAN on the road to the White House. Coming up next on Book Notes, we talk with British historian Martin Gilbert, author of Churchill, A Life. Mr. Gilbert, who served for 25 years as Sir Winston Churchill's official biographer, joins us to discuss the public and private lives of Britain's two-time prime minister. That's next on Book Notes. Martin Gilbert, author of Churchill, A Life. What's your favorite story about <laughs> Winston Churchill? I have so many, really, but there's always one for, for each occasion. My favorite story is the cover you're holding up. This picture was suppressed for 43 years. It was taken when Churchill was in the middle of the Second World War. He was feeling confident that he just won Roosevelt's support for the war effort in Europe. He'd gone up to Ottawa. He'd won the Canadian Parliament round. And he was stopped by a photographer in a corridor who took that lovely picture. And the photographer was dissatisfied. And when Churchill put his cigar in his mouth and started lighting up, the photographer grabbed the cigar and got the famous frowning, disagreeable Churchill, who has graced every postage stamp and every other book cover, and for which millions, incidentally, have been made in, in, in photographic fees. And it's not the real Churchill. I mean, you know, if I were to punch you in the face and then take a picture, whoever saw you like that except me? And so, my favorite picture is this one, and it's the real Churchill and the smiling Churchill. How did you get it for the cover? <laughs> I was promoting the English edition of the book in Canada in May, and found that on my floor of the hotel, where the publishers had put me, was the studio of this photographer, by sheer chance. I didn't even know he was still alive. So I knocked on his door, walked in, there was a ding, like going into a haberdasher shop, and I took it from there. By a combination of charm and <laughs> ingenuity, <laughs> I acquired the picture. It's interesting. If you put an English version of the book out, it goes to Canada instead of the yeah. American version going right. to Canada? Right. Anyway, I was pleased with it because it's, it's the real Churchill. And one of my aims in the book was to get rid of all these myths and carbuncles, you know, the warmonger, the disagreeable man, the imperialist with no vision. So I thought the cover should reflect that. Did you spend much time around Winston Churchill? In 1961, which is exactly 30 years ago, when I was a young kid of 25, I was asked by his son to join a team, rather a chaotic team of people who were trying to help Randolph, his son, in, in preparing this great multi-volume biography. And that's where I really learned my, my trade. I mean, I was the one who had to go through the original papers and bring them to Randolph, my section of, uh, of the history. And there I was, touching his letters, finding his school reports, sometimes even opening it. I was actually over here then in, in, in the States, and I had a wonderful discovery which really get, gave me Randolph's confidence and put me even deeper into the Churchill story. I went to the New York Public Library and I knew that Churchill had had a friendship with an American Tammany Hall boss in New York, and I asked to see the Churchill file in that man's papers. He was called Burke Cochran. And they said, oh, we're terribly sorry, we only have the, the letters from the American novelist Winston Churchill, who was such a person. And it was so cold outside that day, I said, well, all right, let me look at those. And they turned out to be all the letters from my Winston Churchill. They'd been misfiled. And they included a letter he'd written from prison camp on his 25th birthday, a long, fascinating letter. So from that moment, Randall thought <laughs> I was a genius, though all it was was a misfiling. And, uh, and we went from strength to strength. I used to go from archive to archive, meet. I met all his old girlfriends, the girls he'd proposed to, who turned him down and the girls who'd wanted him to marry them and who he'd turned down, including the girl who was so angry that uh, he, he didn't want to marry her, that she said, you know, Winston, all you men are the same. You, know, you are absolutely rotten. And he said, you're quite right, he said. We're all worms, but I do believe I'm a glow worm. 
it's hard to, to be honest with you it's hard to know where to start but let me start with you uh, have you been known as the official biographer I'm called the official biographer though to the enormous credit of the Churchill family they never asked to see a single word of what I was writing until the books were printed and bound and, and ready for sale to the public and I, they never asked me to delete a word or, or to skirt round a particular issue so official is a misnomer if it's thought to mean a censored or restricted biographer. What does it mean to be the official biographer? <laughs> it means some poor sod had to be willing to give 30 years of his working life, give up his university teaching, give up his lecturing, give up the amenities of being, as it were, a clubbable don on an Oxford University high table, and be willing to sit in archives, which I, I enjoyed. I mean, I don't complain about one moment. But basically, it, it, it meant, you know, someone who would do it full time, day after day, for 30 years. What part of Winston Churchill do you enjoy researching the most? What I mean by that is he was an artist, he was an orator, he was a writer, he was a statesman, he was a leader. What, what part got your most, of, most of your attention? I, I think the thing which fascinated me most was his, his work as a parliamentarian. He entered Parliament in, in, in 1900. He, he was very young. He, he was just 25 years old. And, and he spent the next 55 years in the parliament and, and he made that his life I mean, for example he wrote every single one of his parliamentary speeches nowadays it's quite rare as you know for a leading figure to, to write his speeches he might correct what his his speech writers write and he not only wrote them but he rewrote them and he he worked on them and it, it's a common misconception that he just sort of used words in an airy fairy way i mean the famous phrase by jf kennedy he mobilized the english language and sent it into battle was true but he used language for argument to lead the House of Commons again and again, thousands of occasions, through a complicated and unpopular argument. You know, he was arguing, for example, you, something you've got here in the United States since 1933, a minimum wage, which our government still resists. He presented that to the British Parliament, you know, it, for an hour and a half in great and careful detail. So that really is fascinating. How did this man take an unpopular cause and persuade a basically often hostile House of Commons to accept the, the rightness and logic of it. Because he was never a, a dictator. He could never pound the table and say, we'll do it. Everything depended on the votes of the House of Commons. And the years he lived, from when to when? He was born in 1874, and he died in 1965. So it was a long life. He, he passed his 90th birthday. And his fir the first president whom he met was McKinley. And he fortunately also met McKinley's vice president, Teddy Roosevelt, because shortly after he met McKinley, McKinley was assassinated and Roosevelt became president. And he knew Woodrow Wilson well and had many debates with him over whether the Bolsheviks should be contained by the Allies in 1918 or whether they should be allowed to stew in their own juice. Churchill believed that the anti-Bolshevik Russians should be assisted to overthrow Bolshevism and Woodrow Wilson declined. He knew Franklin Roosevelt extremely well. They were the war leaders in World War II. And he knew Truman and greatly respected Truman. He was, in a way, the encourager of the, what became the Truman Doctrine in foreign affairs. He encouraged America to emerge as a world leader. And Eisenhower was somebody with whom he had, when Eisenhower was president, a, a most incredible conflict. I mean, it wasn't personally violent, but it was almost disastrous for Churchill. Churchill wanted, when Stalin died, to go with Eisenhower to Moscow and meet Stalin's successors in Moscow and say, right, now we can end the Cold War. Now we can, re you know, we are strong, we have the nuclear capacity, but we wish to be on good terms with you. We wish to help your economy in return for you moderating your dictatorship. He said, let's at least go to Moscow. And Eisenhower refused and very much humiliated Churchill, both uh, to, his, to Churchill's cabinet and also in the international discussions. Churchill never left it alone. For four years, he kept coming back to it pleading with Ike, let us try and break the Cold War. But, you know, it was the wrong time in American politics, and in the end it was Reagan and Gorbachev and Bush and Gorbachev and Thatcher and Major who did what he had pleaded with Ike to do. You say 55 years. Did he spend all that time in the Parliament? Was he there all those years? He only had a year and a half out of Parliament. And that was in 1922, when uh, he, he had to fight an election, but he just had his appendix out. And he used to joke, he said, at, at one stroke, I lost my place in the government, my seat in Parliament, and my appendix. All three had gone. But he came back after a year and a half. And even in the famous wilderness years, 
when there's a misconception actually in America that he was alone. In fact, there's even a book come out, I can't remember the author, which says, Lion alone. He was never alone in the wilderness years. He had an enormous following in Parliament, in the government circles, in the civil service, and among the public who realized that his warnings that Hitler did have to be confronted if war was to be avoided, Hitler had to be told, look, thus far and no further. He was always in Parliament during those wilderness years. So he, he always had, you know, his place. He was actually on the front bench, as, as you, your viewers know from the British Parliament, quite a powerful place to be. And so his was always a voice within the parliamentary system. He, he was never really out of it. And of course, Churchill, out of office, was a man who went down to his country house, Chartwell in Kent, and had around him probably more cabinet ministers and, and government officials than sat around the cabinet table. I mean, he was a magnet. He, he was fun. He was fun to be with. He was, he was interesting. He, when he was serious, it was something worth, you know, being present at. And so people flocked to him, almost like moths to a lamp. He married how many times? Only once. He was in love with a beautiful girl whom he met in India and went riding on elephants in his youth around the city of Hyderabad in southern India. But she uh, somehow wasn't quite for him. Then he met a pretty girl and hardly noticed her at dinner. And at the end of the dinner, uh, he said, oh, I'm sorry I didn't talk to you, but I've written a book about my father. May I send it to you? And she said, yes, she rather liked him. And she never heard again from him. That was a girl called Clementine. They met four years later. He had forgotten the promise which he hadn't given of sending the book. And he fell in love with her and proposed to her. Even then, though, you know, he was terribly indecisive. We think of him as a man who knew what he wanted and went out to get it. He wanted to marry her, but he didn't know how to do it. And he invited her to Blenheim, where his family lived. And they spent the weekend together, and his cousins noticed he wasn't popping the question. He wasn't asking her. And on the final morning, when she was due to go to London, he was lying in bed. And his cousin, the Duke, went into his bedroom and said, Winston, you've got to get out of bed. He hated getting out of bed in the morning. You've got to get out of bed and propose. So finally he got out, he went into the garden, he couldn't bring himself to do it, it came on to rain, the two of them went for, for shelter into a little sort of ornamental temple, and there he finally said, will you marry me? And she said yes, and from that moment he had nobody else in his life, and she was a wonderful woman, not because she was somehow just ornamental, but as you'll see from the book, whenever she felt he was going wrong, whenever she felt his character was perhaps disintegrating a bit, he was becoming a little rough, she would send him notes, beautifully written notes, Winston, you're not doing the right thing, don't do this, and written with, with love, but also with great firmness. So she was, was more than just an ornament, really, at his table. They were married for how long? They were married in 1908, and when he died in 1965, they were, they were still married. They had how many children? They had five children, one who died as a little child of meningitis before she was three, which is a sad episode in their lives. They had a son, Randolph, whom I worked for, who was wonderfully rambunctious and had a wonderful family life. But, uh, Churchill belonged to that generation, perhaps it's almost gone now, who believed that, every, that the family should always be there. I mean, if a prime minister was coming to tea or a secretary of state was coming to dinner, you had your family around the table and you didn't inhibit the talk. And indeed, if the family was young, as Churchill's family were, of course, when they were young, uh, you had games. You had a lovely game which, which you played the blue cat, the next person said the bright cat, the next one said the bold cat, the brave cat. You tried to exhaust the adjectives beginning with B. And if there was a sector of state or somebody there, he joined, you know, he was invited to join in. And uh, in this way, the children grew up surrounded by, by the most marvelous politics and, and, and humor. And sometimes they had awful rows. I mean, on one occasion, uh, Churchill was sort of laying down the law about something. And suddenly Randolph began to lay down the law. Churchill looked at him and said, stop interrupting me when I'm interrupting. <laughs> but they enjoyed themselves, and uh, animals were part of the, uh, of the show. There were always lots of cats or lots of dogs. In fact, I discovered you know, he's always thought of as the bulldog in British history. And I discovered that when he was a schoolboy at the age of 11, I put it in the book, it was so nice, he sold his bicycle in order to have enough money to buy a bulldog. There are some things, uh, direct American connections. His mother? His mother was born in Brooklyn. There's a little plaque where she was born in Henry Street. She was raised in uh, Rochester. And he always used to say of himself, I'm half American and wholly British. And his enemies said of him, you're half alien and wholly reprehensible. That was a different kettle of fish. He once used his mother's American connection to very powerful effect. He wanted in 1941, in the spring, 
to broadcast the American people to try to explain to them why Britain was at war and why sooner or later the United States would find itself in this war. And clearly, you know, he couldn't do this officially. Roosevelt, you know, couldn't challenge the isolationists by such a method or it would have been awful for him politically. So the two of them arranged. They were great conspirators together in the interests of uh, democracy and defeating tyranny. They arranged for President Valentine of the University of Rochester to invite Churchill to get an honorary degree because it was where his mother grew up. And of course he couldn't come over in the war with the Battle of the Atlantic. So he said as if I'll do I tell you what, President Valentine, why don't I broadcast my acceptance speech? Well, of course, once you're broadcasting across the Atlantic, it can be picked up everywhere from you know, New Orleans to Seattle and uh, from Bangor to San Diego. And so he made his wonderful broadcast to the Americans very understanding of the American predicament, not hectoring, but saying, you know, sooner or later, all good forces must confront the evil forces. And when you do it, you have to be confident that you know why you're doing it, and you have to be very strong to face the setbacks that will come on the way. Our viewers, when they watch the British House of Commons, see a Winston Churchill on the floor of the Commons today. Who is he? That is uh, Churchill's grandson. And indeed, there is a nice American connection there, because his mother, Pamela, is... Mrs. Pamela Harriman, who lives here in Washington, and was at Churchill's side during the Second World War. And there are some lovely stories in the book which she recounts. She was often with him late at night when desperate military moves were imminent. And she was one of the people who witnessed in the intimacy of his study just how concerned he was about the fate of those who were inevitably going to die in these assaults. It, it wasn't for him a game or, 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 a, or, or a statistic. He somehow felt the plight of every soldier. And, uh, and it was because he had been a young soldier. His mother, his American mother, had been given task after task by Churchill, starting from the task, get me to London during Queen Victoria's Jubilee in 1887 when he was 12. He didn't want to see the Queen, he wanted to see Buffalo Bill Cody and Annie Oakley who were performing at Earl's Court with 500 Indians and God knows how many buffaloes. And he instructed his mother later, get me to the scene of action, get me to where the wars are. Incidentally, not to fight. He was a newspaper man. And of course, a newspaper man, it's no good, you know, Peter Arnett sitting in the Savoy in London. He has to be in Baghdad. And so Churchill was always saying to his uh, mother, you know, get me to the scene of action. And uh, she did. And this was her sort of great role. She was the, the pusher. He once said of her very disarmingly, my mother left no stone unturned. She left no cutlet uncooked. <laughs> And indeed, she, she really worked hard to entertain on, on his behalf. And so he saw war at first hand, thanks to his mother. And he saw the cruelties of war. And he was always saying to fellow politicians, the supreme object of statesmanship is to stop war happening. In fact, I found something he wrote which moved me very greatly. I put it in the book. In 1900, after a battle, which many British people regarded as a great victory in South Africa, were excited, the flags went up. He wrote a piece about it, a journalistic piece, he'd been at the battle, but he ended his piece. If modern men of light and leading would see the face of war more often, ordinary folk would see it hardly ever. You've got uh, 1,000 and, this is huge, 1,066 pages in here, but this is the final, is this going to be the final? This is it, all in one volume, from cradle to grave. How many volumes have you written? I wrote six of the eight volumes of the official narrative, and I produced eight volumes of documents, his letters and documents. And in fact, I'm now doing his war documents. But this is everything boiled down to one. It's a sort of, hopefully, a delicious consomme of Churchill's life. Ever count the number of words you've written about Winston Churchill? I never did, but very much to my embarrassment, the Guinness Book of World Records did, and they put it in as the longest biography in the English language. But as I'm not a believer that writing is, has quality because of length, I'm always slightly, well, not ashamed of it, but it's a bit bizarre. It's about eight and a half million words. But you know, I started with 15 tons weight of his letters and papers. So, you know, it had to be constantly reduced and sifted through. And I used to even read his laundry lists. And uh, people said, what can you possibly learn from a laundry list? You certainly can't publish laundry lists. But on one occasion, I found a laundry list from Beirut, from a Beirut hotel. And I thought to myself, I don't, I don't know when Churchill was in Beirut. And from that laundry list, it had a date. 
I discovered a journey which was not, as it were, in the history books, which he'd made to the Middle East, to Beirut, and then to Amman, and then to Jerusalem. And then I found British officials, young British officials at the time, who had been there at that year, 1934, and even then acquired some historical documents about his views and thoughts during that visit. So laundry lists have their uses too. Where did you grow up? I was born in London, and my parents were Londoners. And when I was two and a half, the, the uh, war began, and my father was doing war work, he was doing night work. And so when I was three and a half, I was put on a ship with hundreds of other kids, without my parents, and sent to Canada. And uh, Churchill, incidentally, had been against this. He regarded it as a sort of scuttle. And when one of the ships was sunk, and children drowned, many children drowned, he stopped it. So I was there with about 4,000 other kids in Canada. And I discovered when I was writing this book that in 1944, just at the time of the Normandy landings, Churchill saw that the Mauritania, a great ocean liner, which had been converted to a troop ship, was in New York, uh, anchored in the Hudson. And uh, there were only 3,000 troops going back on it to, to Britain, because, of course, the, the American forces were already over there. So he said, why not bring the children back from Canada? So telegrams were sent, and I was among the children who was rounded up. I was put on a train by myself in Toronto Station. One of the most vivid memories of my life is arriving. I was then seven and a quarter, Grand Central Station with a label around my neck. Grand Central, I and mean, it still looks a big, <laughs> big station. But then for a little boy, it was very big. And there were li I remember the great sort of lines and soldiers and enormous crowd. And I waited patiently. I don't think I cried. And finally someone came and said, you know, little boy, come with me. It was a very hot June day in 44, and I was led to the docks. I went back there the day before yesterday to see the, the pier where we, we embarked. And then I found in Churchill's papers a little note where he put against the Mauritania story, the Mauritania file, make sure there are enough lifeboats on board for the extra children. Now that's interesting, isn't it? This man who then was having to defeat Hitler in Normandy, counter the flying bomb, deal with the whole problem of defeating Japan. Still remember the there were extra kids on the ship, better make sure there are enough lifeboats in case the ship goes down. Where'd you go to school? I went to school at Highgate, which is a private school in London. When the war was over, my father brought me back to London. He'd been evacuated himself to North Wales. And suddenly it was the first day of the school term, and, and Dad had made no arrangements. I mean, he'd been involved in the war, he, you know, many people were in that boat. So he put me in a car of a friend. And we drove round London until he found a school which had a place for one little boy. Uh, it was a boarding school. I was then eight and a half. And I went to that school from 1945 till uh, 1954. And then I went into the British Army. And when I finished my military duties, my military service, I went up to university. Okay. So I was somehow a boarder all my life. I was at boarding school in the army, of course. You're, <laughs> you're in your barracks. And at Oxford, you're, though very pleasantly, in, uh, you know, students' lodgings at Oxford. And finally, in, you know, I graduated in 1960. And a year later, Randolph Churchill said, join my team. Do you have any reason to know why he did? I mean, was there some specific thing that <coughs> caught his attention when it came to you? Yes, immediately after I graduated, I, I wrote a book with, with my very first pupil, a marvelous person called Richard Gott, who, who later became a distinguished journalist on, on The Guardian. And we wrote a book called The Appeasers together. We were very excited by it. We were young historians exposing somehow Neville Chamberlain's, not just his desire to postpone war, but his, his desire to get on good terms with Hitler. And we found a lot out about that. And one of Randolph's friends read it, and she said to Randolph, you really ought to get this young man and talk to him. She used a lovely phrase in her letter, which he showed me. He is full of zeal to set history right. And anyway, he started sending me telegrams, and I'd heard of him only as a terrible drunk and right-wing sort of fascist beast, of, you know, the portrayal of students of those days. But finally, the, the head of my college, who had actually been Churchill's research assistant in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, said to me, you know, why don't you go? You'll have an amusing evening, you'll have a lot of stories to dine out on, and, uh, you know, you'll come back the next morning. Well, I went. Uh, I had an amusing and amazing evening. And the next morning, instead of coming back, Randolph said to me, will you join my team? And I joined it. I thought I'd last four or five months. I lasted five years. He died. I thought I'd write the biography, what was left to be done in five or six years. And I finished it, the multi-volume, three years ago. Were you around him when he died? 
Well, I was actually on holiday when he died. The whole thing was very distressing because uh, in his last months, uh, Randolph was not well, but he, he had a wonderful brain. I had a lot of respect for Randolph. He loved history. He was full of zeal for setting it right. You're talking about the son. The son, right. And, and he once said to me, you know, Martin, I'm not interested in whitewashing my father. I'm interested in the truth. And he was. There was such a thing as historical truth for him, and indeed, I hope, for me. And uh, in the last year of his life, the Kennedy family asked him to write the biography of, of, of J.F. Kennedy. And he was very, very understandably flattered by that and, and moved by that. And so, as well as continuing with the biography in the last year with the church biography, he became, if you like, distracted by the challenge of Kennedy. I mean, he intended to finish Churchill first. On the other hand, he couldn't quite bring himself not to sort of begin thinking about the Kennedy. And uh, Robert Kennedy was the member of the family who had, who had really sort of uh, asked him to do it. In fact, I, I listened in. It was my job to listen into the phone conversation when Robert Kennedy asked him. And then Robert Kennedy was assassinated and Randolph died within 24 hours of each other. 1968. 68. And suddenly the whole pack of cards uh, collapsed. It was a great tragedy. Um, and, uh, but I, I respected Randolph Churchill. He wanted to tell his father's story. And when, all, when I was writing my volumes, in particular when I was writing this volume, I always thought, you know, not only would Winston Churchill, you know, sort of feel I was doing it properly, but would Randolph uh, Churchill feel it. When people say to me, oh, well, he was just an alcoholic, there's a new book out about him as an alcoholic and the whole Churchill family as drinker. I think, well, you know, with me, we had many long days and nights when, you know, his mind was crystal clear and history was what we were doing and getting his father's story right was what we were about. And he told lovely stories about his father, some of which I was able to put in my book. You know, when he told his stories, he used to, I, if I would laugh, he'd say, that's for my book, not your book. And of course, poor Randolph died, and, and the stories ended up in my book. Is there such a thing that's built up over the years as a Martin Gilbert ink? I mean, in other words, where have you got a big force behind you that helps you do research and secretaries. Yeah, and I've, I've always believed in doing it oneself. I've always done all my own research. I, I was very lucky indeed that uh, I always had one person to help me, you know, sort the files and go with me to the archives. Uh, if only because under the British system, one person can only call for three files, but two people can call for six. And uh, one of my assistants, Larry Arn, is now running a, a policy study unit in, in Claremont in California. He was extremely good, but unfortunately he fell in love with my secretary, so he married her and she's also in California. And then I got another assistant who came, and uh, this was in 1971, and I fell in love with her. So she is now my wife, and in fact she has been ever since my... We sit together and we read every document together. And I then write the chapter, and she then reads it and says, wait a minute, you haven't properly interpreted that document, or you haven't got the best out of it, or you've exaggerated what it says. So it's been the two of us. And the whole biography I wrote in pen and ink. In fact, I, <laughs> this is the pen I wrote the eighth volume with. I was a pen and ink man. And then my wife said, for this one volume, we have to become modern creatures. I just want to, uh, want to uh, see what kind of pen is this? It's called a pelican. It's, it's a serviceable ink British pen. British pen? I think it may be <laughs> French. I'm not sure. I bought it in San Francisco. And you, wrote, and you wrote the entire eighth volume? With yes, it? with that pen. And then I bought another pen to write this volume with, and my wife said, put it away, we have to become modern. And so I acquired a computer. And I wrote this on computer, and I must say, I enjoyed it enormously. Uh, though I did at one point put in a tease, which I forgot to eliminate from the disc, but it's not in the American edition. <laughs> the British edition has it, but I deleted it for the American edition. Uh, this uh, volume costs $35. Do you have any idea, no. at, as, as we sit here, how many of the, these things you'll sell? I, I believe that about 35,000 have sold. It came out on the 1st of November, so it's had, what, a, a, almost a month's run, three, four weeks' run. And it's now, in its, the second reprint is out, and hopefully third, fourth, fifth reprint, if your viewers all rush to buy it. I, I would guess it has a, it, hopefully it'll go on selling, because it is the one, the sole one-volume work which contains his his most personal stories, most personal letters. And uh, everybody said, you'll never do it in one volume. You know, there are many multi-volumes, mostly incomplete, but, you know, many people have tried a multi-volume, including myself. And, uh, you know, the average man in the street can't carry around an eight-volume or even a three-volume set of a biography. Can you buy the eight-volume set at one stop? You can, actually, and it's now come out in England in paperback, so it's even physically much more manageable. 
But, uh, you know, my idea was a one volume. You know, we live in an age where, you know, much as one would like to sit down and read books, I mean, even I just bought today Carlyle's History of the French Revolution in Georgetown in an abridged version because I wanted to reread it and I thought, you know, I ought to read the, the three volumes, but you can't. So here's Churchill in one volume. He fits. I mean, you know, there's more to say, but there's so much there that, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, I sometimes go on holiday to a village in the Vaucluse, and the nearest town is called Apt in southern France. And there they have a cake called an Aptienne when you're really feeling a bit peckish. And it's a, a sort of fruit cake which only has fruit, if you know what I mean. There's a bit of cake and a lot of fruit. Anyway, I, I like to feel this is the book. It's a yeah, fruity yeah. book. One, one more question on the eighth volume. Uh, how much would it cost today if you bought all eight volumes? And can you buy it hardback or is it just paperback? Uh, you can get it in hardback, you can get it in paper. In paperback, the whole thing would be about, uh, well, eight times to 80 pounds. What's that? About uh, $100, $120. More than that. Be yeah, $150. Right, right, yes. 150. dollars The hardback, uh, eight volumes, would be more like $220, $230. If Winston Churchill were alive today and lived in this country and had to join an American political party, <laughs> Any idea what he'd be, based on what he thought, what he, yeah. what he cared well, about? Well, he, he, he had belonged to both the equivalent of the Democrat and Republican parties. He'd been a liberal and a conservative. How many years in uh, each party? About the same. Twenty very active years as a liberal and a reformer and a social reformer and a minimum wage man. And a At what point in his life? Uh, from the age of 30 to 50. So he started off as a conservative in the House? He was briefly conservative, but hated the, the then class-ridden nature of the Conservative Party, and also he hated its aggressive imperialism. So he joined the Liberals. He became a great pioneer of social reform. He introduced widows' pensions, orphans' pensions. He introduced the whole system of, of fair deal at the workplace, you know, the, a break for meals for people in enterprises. He believed that everybody in their workplace, the cameraman behind your cameras, should have a share in the profit of the company. So he, he was, in that sense, a radical. And then he became a conservative in 1924, when he was already uh, 50. And uh, as a conservative, was a very good conservative, because he, he believed in the defense of the realm as something paramount, and he, he believed in not groveling to dictators and not giving in to bullying internationally. But he wanted what his father had called Tory democracy, a conservatism with a genuinely classless face. And it's interesting that John Major, our new, and, and in my view, excellent, uh, Conservative Prime Minister, has spoken of his desire to establish a classless society, which was really what Churchill was struggling for. As to the parties, he always said, I've belonged to both political parties. And then he'd say with a smile, and I've despised them both equally, you see. And my guess is he, he, he would uh, join one of the two American parties and try to change it. He would try to change it in the direction he wanted. Uh, he, he had enormous, I mean, I've looked at, you know, the Democrat and Republican programs, and he had enormous sympathy for, for things in both of them, which essentially, I mean, he, he felt the supreme goal of statesmanship was in international affairs to preserve peace, but not at all costs. In other words, preserve peace unless the tyranny or the threat were such that it had to be confronted and had to be defeated, and at home to maintain the genuine unity of the nation. That is to say, there should be nobody whether it was race or economic situation or creed, nobody who had an inferior position in the society. And I'm not talking about welfare handouts. He believed in free enterprise. But that the poorest person should have the opportunity to avail himself of what free enterprise could provide a person. And for that reason, you know, he even, when he was in charge of the prisons, as home sector, I think that would be sector of the interior here, he... Uh, he fought very hard to give prisoners, people who are convicted criminals, the, the same opportunities once they were released from prison to rise in society. And indeed, he introduced programs in prisons to enable them, when they came out, to, as he put it, establish themselves quickly in the world of industry and, you know, to be rehabilitated. He even abolished the, the system whereby the police controlled prisoners once they were released and introduced what we call the probation system, where an independent probation service, a non-police service, supervises uh, prisoners. And incidentally, it was Robert Kennedy who became very interested in, in, in Churchill's philosophy of the rights of even a convicted criminal against the state. In other words, you couldn't push any group of society down and say, we're not interested in you. And he fought very hard, for example, 
for those who were disabled at work. He believed the state had some sort of obligation, should make some contribution to people like that, to enable them to, to lead a decent life. The other thing which I think is going to be a feature of, of current politics, and either the Democrats or the Republicans can grasp it, it's up to you know, their political genius, he believed that at some point the emphasis in industrial societies must move from hours of work, which in his day he progressively reduced, you know, you made the hours of work less onerous, less long, that the shift should be from hours of work to hours of leisure. That, that in the end the state must concern itself with the ability of people to, to use and exploit their leisure time. That facilities should be provided. That's why when somebody once asked him in World War II, you know, where do you want your, where do you want your statue to go when you're dead, the great war leader? He said, I don't really want a statue. I, I would like there to be parks in areas where people have no parks. So that those people whose leisure time cannot include walking in a park will have a park. And it's interesting that when he died and there was a move to set up his statue, the, the one that's in Parliament Square now, his widow, Clementine, wrote to the London Times, pointing out this, that her husband actually had not wanted statues, but parks. Eight cabinet positions in his life? Yes, he entered the British cabinet in, uh, well, a long time ago, in, in 1908, when he was still in his mid-thirties, and he was last in the cabinet in 1955. In fact, I was very interested to discover, quite by chance, I, I met all the members of his final cabinet. And they recall all the ones who are still alive, which was the majority. Uh, and, and I knew Anton Eden and Harold Macmillan, and they both helped me enormously with my work. And some of their recollections are there. And one of them said, you know, we, were, we all said goodbye to him, and it was the day before his, his official retirement from public life. And he said, there are two things I'd like to say to you. He said, first of all, always remember that man is spirit. And second, he said, never be separated from the Americans. Now, he didn't make a great oratorical flourish, just these two little points. Man is spirit, which he always believed. He always believed man had the capacity for self-improvement. He was always an optimist in the ultimate evolution of human destiny. And never be separated from the Americans, the intensely practical. You know, we are no longer a world power. We're not a superpower. We and the Americans share common ideals, common heritage, common goals, stick to them. And he believed that. I found a letter which he wrote in 1916. He was always a man of foresight, in which he said, uh, from now on, you know, this was after the United States had come into World War I, but had not yet sent its troops over. And he knew that until the American troops came, there could be no victory over Germany on the Western Front. And he, he wrote in 1916, you know, everything now, the future of the world depends on the United States. The fact that she's a democracy, the fact that she is, you know, basically a decent country, that she doesn't intend to dominate others, that is the way the, the world will go forward in the 20th century. And we must make sure we're associated with her, not only so that we can, I don't know, be protected or get rich, but because this is the side we're on. He was Prime Minister how many times, and from what years? He was Prime Minister twice. He, he was, first of all, Prime Minister from 1940 to 1945. In 1940, the, the government had, had basically tried to pursue a war on a party basis, a conservative party which was in power running the war. And this was not satisfactory to, to the British people, and it was not good for the conduct of the war. And there was a great demand from the Labour Party that they should have a place, and generally from people of no party that, you know, the war should be seen to be a united effort at the top, as, uh, because after all the workers were having to work 24 hours a day, shifts, you know, multiple shifts. And so he became Prime Minister of an all-party government, and, and that was his finest hour, really. And, and one of the things I show in the book was his enormous ability to give each person the authority he needed within his sphere of war administration. You know, as Ernest Bevin, who was a a labor man of distinction, and, and, and he was made Minister of Labor, was given somehow a free reign to organize the labor aspect. Of course, Churchill was never an anti-union man. That was a, an interesting aspect. But still, he brought in all parties, and he brought in professionals. Uh, and then, in 1945, when the war was ending, the British public said, let's go back to party politics, and to hell with the Conservative Party, who 
betrayed us before the war. And of course, Churchill had been one of those who had always cried out, the conservatives are betraying us before the war, not standing up to Hitler, not rearming the nation, not getting on good terms with the United States. So he played his part in his own defeat in 1945, because people gave a thumbs down to the conservatives. But he then became leader of the party, or leader of the opposition, and he rebuilt the Conservative Party. He brought in young men like Harold Macmillan, who was later Prime Minister, and R.A. Butler, who was later Chancellor of the Exchequer, the head of the Treasury. And he gave them great authorities. For example, he gave Macmillan the brief of devising a housing policy, not unlike uh, Jack Kemp's present housing policy. You know, you must build houses and uh, on a scale which is commensurate with the needs. And so the, the public responded to this. They saw that the old Churchill had somehow created a new party. And uh, they voted him back in, and he became Prime Minister for the second time in 1951. And he remained Prime Minister through his 80th birthday for another four and a half years till 1955. And one nice thing is that when he retired, he said, I'm not going to interfere. My successors have had their training, they've got their opportunity. And although he's always thought of as some sort of interfering person, he, he, he left them alone. And at the time of the Suez Crisis, when Anton Eden, his successor, went to war with Egypt, and as you know, the United States uh, opposed Britain's action, Churchill had certain views, and he didn't want to make them public, he didn't want to embarrass Eden, so he set off in his motor car from his little country house, about four hours' drive from where Eden was at that time, and halfway he pulled into a lay-by and dictated to his secretary a little note, just a page, drove on to Eden's residence, left it Know, at the door, and return back another four hours' drive to his home. A week doesn't go by in this country where some politician, somebody making a speech somewhere, quotes Winston Churchill as saying something to the effect, uh, it was Winston Churchill that said, democracy is the worst form of government except for every other form, or something. I mean, they, and people are always... Right doing something right. to that. What was the real story? On no, that? that's what he said. Of course, but what I, I, I share Mario Cuomo's view, that everything has to be taken in context. I've been following this debate whether Cuomo should declare himself or not, and, and one of the papers quoted him as saying, it was exactly 30 days ago when I began my trip trying to help my book on its way, and, and, and he said everything has to be put in its context, has to be weighed and studied in its context. And I understood exactly what he meant, because what Churchill was really saying was, you are flirting with fascism, you are flirting with communism. Another one is flirting with some extreme right or extreme left view. But when all's said and done, democracy for all its faults is the only way forward. And he believed this. He, you know, as I said, you asked me you know, earlier, his life was spent in Parliament. And he was always prepared to, first of all, bow to the wishes of Parliament and uh, to argue his case very carefully before Parliament. And you know, he, one of the things that comes out in the book is that he, he, he had enormous numbers of enemies, enormous setbacks. It's not a study in failure, because I don't believe Churchill was a failure, and, and certainly his ideas weren't failures, but it was a, it's a study in setbacks and blows. I mean, not only the physical blow, he was squashed flat on Fifth Avenue and uh, 86th Street in 1931, I mean, almost into a pancake, and nobody thought he would survive. But the blows of defeat, the blows of, of, of Parliament turning against him, the blows of, of, of the government refusing to follow his lead, and his incredible resilience in bouncing back. So I mean, it, it's one of the features of the book that even as a school kid he was being accused of things which he hadn't done and was having to defend himself. And uh, recently I, I read in the paper that uh, Vice President Quayle was being accused of some involvement in, 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 in drugs and drug trafficking. And I wanted to write to him and say, look, don't take it tragically. When Churchill was 20 and a young soldier, he was accused of buggery. And, you know, that's, you know, a terrible accusation. Well, he ended up Prime Minister. It just took quite a long time. Why was he accused of buggery and what is it? You don't know what buggery is? Define it, please. Oh, dear. Well, <laughs> sorry, I thought the word was... Buggery is what used to be called uh, the, an unnatural... <laughs> act of the Oscar Wilde type. It's how it was actually phrased in the euphemism of the British papers. It's, uh, you don't know what bugger is. And when was he... <laughs> anyway, it's a very nasty thing which men and do who, to each other. who accused him? He was accused by a fellow cadet at Sandhurst 
who had a grievance against Churchill. Churchill was very successful. He was a very successful map maker. He was a very successful horse rider. And somehow, you know, this young man, he understood that if you make an accusation against Winston Churchill, the, even the 20-year-old, energetic, ambitious, appearing everywhere, views on everything, a nasty accusation could stick. Enough people would say, hmm, perhaps there's something to it. Perhaps this man is a deviant. Perhaps he is a bugger. And uh, Churchill had to bring a libel action, which he won. And uh, it was the first of, I suppose, 30 libel actions in his career, which he had to bring against this sort of charge. You know, he once escaped from a prisoner of war camp in South Africa as a young man, uh, got over the wall. And his political enemies said, ah, he didn't really escape. He had given his parole. And uh, he had promised, you know, that he would behave and he was going to be let out. And then just as a show off, knowing that he was going to be let out, he broke his parole and jumped over the wall. And, and this was untrue. And I went to South Africa and I found the actual prison authorities' correspondence, from which it's clear that they refused to give him any special treatment, that they said he will be held here even more carefully guarded than the other prisoners because he's a troublemaker, he'll, he'll, he'll write about the war and so on. And he really did have to jump over the wall and had a very extraordinary series of very narrow escapes with death before he got back to England. And of course, as an escapee, he was a hero and that's what propelled him into Parliament, a young man who had jumped over the wall. You told us when we started this that this picture was new and that you found it in Canada. Right. Anything else new about this in this volume, stuff that uh, you didn't have in your other eight? Do you know, there's probably something new on every page. It was, my f it was my ambition that you would open the book anywhere and read a page and say halfway down, I never knew that. That is new. And, oh, there are all sorts of things, all sorts of, uh, I mean, like the letter which he wrote when he escaped from the prisoner of war camp, which he left under his pillow. And the grandson of the commandant, the prison commandant, gave it to me in Pretoria, came to see me in Pretoria and said, by the way, we have this letter. And so it, it, it's full of lovely new things and uh, full of little aspects of uh, history which perhaps have been neglected and forgotten. And also his humour and his, his all-roundness. You mentioned his, his painting. I mean, he, 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 he wasn't an obsessive man about politics. He was obsessive about right and wrong, but right and wrong in the wider sense. Even fairness, you know, in the family. He, he, he made sure, for example, that when he went abroad to his conferences, if one child went to one, if Randolph went to one, then he'd ask his daughter Sarah to another. He was immensely fair. He, he, he hated anything which smacked of unfairness, of, of social unfairness, political unfairness, and of course international unfairness, the evil of, of totalitarianism. That was his great enemy. And uh, he never compromised with evil, though he understood that sometimes your country could be so weak that there was nothing you could do. And uh, you had to see things which you believed in blotted out. That's what happened, of course, at the Yalta Conference, where he fought so hard, and incidentally, Roosevelt did not uh, betray the democracies that some Americans have been taught. Both, in a way, and their staffs fought so hard for a democratic Poland, but the Red Army had already occupied Poland, and there was no way in which they could make war on Stalin. And therefore, you know, the fate accompli was there. What I found and put in this book was that Churchill wanted to hold the Yalta Conference before the Red Army had overrun Eastern Europe, when you still could have some sort of argument and bargaining. And of course, you still had your armies to direct in particular directions. And he proposed, of course, Yalta uh, was something that came up later, he proposed Jerusalem as the site of the conference. Why? Because Roosevelt, who could only travel by ship, could go all the way to Haifa port on the Quincy. And because Stalin, who would only travel by train, could go from Moscow to Jerusalem by train in those days, and Churchill even sent him the railway route and, the, as it were, the, the timetable. And Churchill, who was older and sicker than both of them in a curious way, would fly. Uh, but uh, they turned down the Jerusalem conference. Stalin said he didn't want to leave Russia, and Roosevelt said he couldn't leave the United States because, of course, he had uh, the elections coming up. October was very close to November. And it may be that the Jerusalem conference would have done what Yalta couldn't do. But the ifs of history are not for me, they're for the novelist who comes along afterwards. Anything about him you didn't like? Well, you know, I wasn't in the business of, of like and dislike. 
sometimes I read things of his which I felt, oh dear, you know, I wouldn't have said that or I wouldn't have done that. And sometimes I read things and I said, goodness me, how wise, how extraordinary. But I felt my job wasn't to impose that judgment on the reader. I had to say to the reader, to you, this is what he really stood for, this is what he really did, what he really said. You may like it or you may not like it. I mean, one very uh, clear example. He believed that Britain should relinquish Southern Ireland, Catholic Ireland, and establish, and he negotiated, he established himself, uh, the Irish Free State. He brought in the Irish Free State Bill, an independent Catholic government in Dublin, which exist to this day. Now, many British conservatives regarded that as the thin end of the wedge. You know, this was the heartland of the British Empire. You know, to give up Dublin? You know, what will he give up next? Windsor Castle? So, you know, if you were a, 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 a British conservative with that perspective on Ireland, you would find that a very distressing chapter. And many uh, people who, for example, uh, he wanted the Jews to have a national home and a state. And he believed that arrangements should be made so that the Jews could become a majority, even if Arabs had to become a minority. And for that reason, persuaded Roosevelt to exclude Palestine from the terms of the Atlantic Charter, which would have given one man one vote in 1945 and meant an Arab majority. And he said, no, I'm committed to a Jewish majority in Palestine. Now, many people find that offensive and even racist. In fact, I even read one American biographer who called him racist because of this sort of attitude. But that's for you to decide. I mean, it'll depend on your perspective and your, your view of events. Was he an interferer? I mean, that's something which, you know, people say, well, it's very distressing how he interfered. Then I found an example of his interference. In 1921, he said to the British government in Baghdad, we ought to establish an independent homeland for the Kurds in northern Iraq. Because one day, a government in Iraq might come to being which will persecute the Kurds. Well, his advisor said, this is interference. You know, this is what a biographer will say. You know, look at that, bad news. And they wrote him a letter and they said, we're not prepared to do this because Britain will always be able to exercise a restraining influence in Baghdad. Well, they were wrong. We now know they were wrong. But if you were reading it from the perspective of a civil servant, an administrator, it would be one more example of this unpleasant feature of always interfering, always knowing better. He lived to be 90. He smoked cigars every day? Well, he lit cigars every day. He didn't always smoke. <laughs> Did he drink a lot? In moderation. He, drank, he, li he liked nice wines and good wines. I can strongly recommend you some of the wines he liked. But uh, if you were to drink his whiskey and water, you would say, why hasn't someone put some whiskey in this water? Did he eat a lot of red meat? Constantly. He loved red. Well, <laughs> on one occasion when, when, he, was, when he was coming from uh, Ottawa to, 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 to Washington, he was served an enormous American steak o on the train. He, he said, I, 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 I'm not a cannibal. <laughs> he couldn't understand you know, so much with me. But he loved food. He was a great uh, eater. He could sometimes eat a whole roast chicken for breakfast. Uh, he had an insatiable appetite. He loved good food. Uh, he loved what he called an important pudding. Uh, if he was given a, a dessert which uh, was nothing much to it, he'd say, this pudding has no theme. He, li he liked it to be important. Now, he had a voracious appetite. And he, uh, you know, he, he enjoyed every aspect of life to the full. He, he sleep had a fun. lot? Yes, he, he was a good sleeper. He read an enormous amount. You know, he's almost the only person I've come across. I don't know what the President of the United States does. It'd be interesting to know. But before he went to bed, he arranged for all the newspapers, which of course were all, are published in our country at about midnight, to, be, to, to get all the newspapers. And he read all the newspapers. He didn't just read, you know, the London Times. He read the Times and the Guardian, the News Chronicle, and the popular papers and the mass circulation paper, and even the communist paper. He only cut out the communist paper when he was so hard up that uh, his wife said, darling, we must cut down on the papers. We haven't got enough money. And then he reluctantly took out the communist paper and one or two others. But he read all the papers. And he read them and he absorbed them. And anything in them that he found that smacked of, that he didn't like, or, or that caught some spark of his imagination, he would follow it up. 
He would call in a shorthand writer and dictate something. And uh, even ministers were often surprised in the morning to get a minute from him, saying, I see in the papers that, you know, your department has done this or that, and pray, pray tell me why. He'd say, pray tell me this, pray tell me. And they were known as his prayers. <laughs> and God helped the minister who didn't have an answer or couldn't find somebody to give an answer. Was he faithful to his wife? He was absolutely faithful to her. He adored his wife. And he... Uh, he, he was a very, he was faithful and he was a very honest man. He, 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 he had very high moral standards. And people understood that. And I, I found, and I told the story once or twice in the book, that when other ministers, even of the opposition party, were in some trouble of the sort nowadays that of course would make the headlines, sexual or financial, they would go to him. They knew that he would somehow give them good and disinterested advice and would be totally discreet and never tell anybody. Now, that's a, an extraordinary thing. Now, you know, I, I've always thought that tells you something of his qualities. Because it's not, you know, Winston Churchill, the war leader and the monolith and, 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 and the man with the frown. It, it's a man to whom people who were even his opponents went for advice and guidance. He was a very good guide. And he, he had a various sort of, you know, little standard things. If someone came and said, oh, I don't know whether to do this or not. Uh, I mean, this example, that's what I should not mention in the Cuomo context, but he used to say, when you're in doubt as to whether to lay an egg or not, don't. <laughs> in other words, you know, if something is really bugging you, you're not sure whether you should do it or not, don't do it. And he, he had these various sort of little rules of thumb. And so. Last question, what is uh, Martin Gilbert going to do for the rest of his life? Well, Martin Gilbert, I, I know him quite well. He's got a few ideas. Uh, he's going to finish Churchill's wartime documents, which will be a five-volume set. And then he's embarking upon a three-volume history of the 20th century, and he hopes that'll see him out to the end of the century. This is what the book looks like. It's called Churchill, A Life by his official biographer, Martin Gilbert. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Join us next week on Book Notes when our guest will be New York Newsday columnist Jimmy Breslin, author of Damon Runyon, A Life. That's next Sunday at 8 and 11 p.m. Eastern Time. For a transcript of tonight's Book Notes program, send $5 to C-SPAN Transcripts in care of Typewriter Incorporated, Post Office Box 885 in Lincolnshire, Illinois. The zip code is 60069. Coming up next, it's this week's Question Time from the British House of Commons.